All right, would you please stand as I read our text for this morning? I'll be reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, as you, can, you know, and you probably have already guessed, today is Baptism Sunday, which is a great... See, you guys had better coffee than the eight o'clock. I like that. It's Baptism Sunday, okay? And uh, you gotta just acknowledge and own up from the outside, this just looks incredibly weird, right? This is incredibly odd. We have a feeding trough here on the stage, right? This is not fancy. I think this was bought from Wilco or something. So we have a feeding trough, and, uh, and it's full of tap water, okay? So the water hasn't been piped in or shipped in from anywhere. This is just regular water from the same source many of you drank from this morning. It has been warmed up, okay? And I... I it still feels pretty good, okay? So, um, but what is going on? Why in the world are people going to be getting up in front of others and getting into a feeding trough full of tap water? What does it all mean? My hope is to explain what this means uh, plainly and clearly for you this morning. For some of you, perhaps for many of you, this is simply going to be a reminder of things you already know. This is not the first time you've heard these things. But as Paul, in writing to the church in Philippi, said, it wasn't a burden for him to remind them of the things they already knew. It's not a burden for you to be reminded of the truth of the gospel, the good news of Christ. For others, this is going to be the first time that you hear it. Either it's the first time you've heard it with your ears, or this morning may be the first time that you hear it with your soul. What is true may penetrate your heart. What that means is that this could be the most important day of your life. You have to understand that baptism is all about Christ and his gospel. Apart from Jesus, baptism makes absolutely no sense. So as we examine our text this morning, I want to focus on three important, vital, fundamental questions that this text answers for us. They are this, who is Jesus? Second of all, what did he do? And third, what difference does it make? Who is Jesus? What did he do? And what difference does it make? We'll start with the first question. Who is Jesus? This is the most important question you will ever wrestle with in your entire life. This is the most important question. Who is this Jesus that every other world religion is mentioning and talking about? Who is this Jesus who has inspired songs for the last 2,000 years all around the world? Who is this Jesus that has inspired and motivated people to create work and uh, works of art in honor of him? Who is this man that for the last 2,000 years, people all around the world, from multiple areas, from multiple ethnicities, from multiple regions, all throughout history. Who is this man that people are putting their faith and their trust in? Who is Jesus? You have to acknowledge that many people want to provide this answer. Jesus was a great teacher and a moral example for us. Jesus is a teacher, and he's a great moral example for us. But you have to understand, the apostle Paul says, if you conclude that Jesus is a teacher and a moral example, you are regarding him according to the flesh, meaning you are missing the truth of who Christ is. To accord Jesus to the flesh or to regard Jesus according to the flesh is to say, here is a Jewish man who lived in the first century who did amazing things, but that's it. 
Who is this Jesus? And the question really, first and foremost, is not who do you think he is? The question is, who did he say he was? Let Jesus speak for himself. Who did Jesus claim to be? And then we can ask the question, who do we say that he is? So who is this Jesus? C.S. Lewis suggested that there are only three rational answers to that question, right? There are only three possible answers to the question, who is Jesus? Here are the possibilities. Jesus is a liar. Jesus is a lunatic. He actually said, on the level with a man who thinks he's a poached egg. That's C.S. Lewis for you. He's a liar. He's a lunatic. Or Jesus is Lord. He presented this in his work, Mere Christianity, Why does Lewis say liar, lunatic, or Lord and leave out the option of great man and teacher and moral example? Why does he do that? It's because C.S. Lewis understood what Jesus actually claimed for himself. He understood what Jesus actually said about himself. Let me, let me, let's look at three texts really quickly just to kind of establish who Jesus claimed he was. John chapter 10, okay? Jesus has healed somebody, and the religious elite ruling group, they're ready to stone him. They're ready to put him to death, okay? So he's healing people like, we don't like people being healed. Let's kill this guy. Verse 33, okay? Uh, So Jesus says, who do you think I am? That's essentially what's happening here. In verse 33, it says, the Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, what? Make yourself God. Those who opposed Jesus, the religious elite, opposed him because they understood he was claiming something. He was making himself out to be God. Matthew chapter 16. This is where Jesus is questioning his disciples. Who do they say that he is? It says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. His question, who am I? Peter's answer, you are the son of God, the Christ. Later in John chapter 20, those of you who were here with, for, for Easter, we looked at the conversion of Thomas. Thomas was one of the disciples, and he said, I'm never going to believe this whole resurrection thing unless I see Jesus with my own eyes and I'm able to touch his body and his wounds with my own hands. So Jesus presents himself to Thomas. Thomas sees and he touches, and here is Thomas's response. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, not my teacher, not rabbi, not example, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, okay? So I'm just just randomly picking three situations in which the identity of Jesus comes up. The deity of Jesus comes up. The religious ruling class wanted to stone him because he claimed to be God. Peter confessed that Jesus was the son of the living God. And Thomas confessed that Jesus was his Lord and his God. Now hear me. Jesus never corrected or rebuked Peter or Thomas for mistaking his identity. You understand? If Jesus wanted to set the record straight as people are like, hey, you're making yourself out to be God. You're the son of the living God. You're my God and my Lord. Jesus would say, wait, wait, stop, stop. There's a huge, there's a huge mistake here. That's not who I am. But Jesus doesn't do that. When Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, that is affirmed by Christ. When, when Thomas confesses that that Jesus is his Lord and his God. Jesus blesses that, okay? So Jesus didn't rebuke them. He did not correct him. Rather, he makes it clear that their profession and their understanding that Jesus was claiming not to be a good teacher, but to be the son of God, God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, that they were right 
in that understanding. So Jesus clearly believed and taught and claimed clearly and emphatically that he was the son of God, God in the flesh. Now this is why C.S. Lewis said there's only three options. There's only three options. Jesus claimed he was God. Jesus could be lying. He could be lying. Does a teacher who lies about being God, is that a good teacher? That's not a good teacher. That's not a moral example. That's, that's immoral, right? So Jesus could be lying. He could know that he's not actually God, but he's claiming to be God. Second, Jesus could be a lunatic, meaning Jesus thinks he's God, right? He's actually deceived himself to this level where he thinks he's God and he's claiming to be God. He's not right, but he thinks he's right. But follow this. If Jesus is not lying to us about being God, and if Jesus is not crazy and deceived, there's only one other option on the table. That is that he's speaking the truth and that he actually is Lord and God. The world wants to regard Jesus as a teacher, as a man, as an example, as anything other than what he actually claimed to be. That was God with us. A Christian friend is somebody who no longer regards Christ according to the flesh, but has come to see Jesus Christ for who he is. Who is he? In verse 18, the apostle Paul says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Do you see what he's saying here? God has reconciled sinners to himself through whom? Through Christ, through Christ alone. That is to say that Christ alone is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is Messiah. He is the one, the only one through whom the Father is reconciling sinners like us to himself. Who is Jesus? He is Christ. He is Lord. He is God with us. What did Jesus do? Well, I kind of just told you what he did, right? Like he reconciled us to God. But what does that mean? What does it mean to say that Christ has reconciled us? What did Jesus do for us as sinners to be reconciled? What did that require? Look at verse 21. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We can say it this way. For our sake, the Father made the Son to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in the Son, that is in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. This is what Martin Luther referred to as the great exchange. You and I and every human being that has ever lived with the exception of Christ, we all have a big, massive, fat problem. We all have this problem. The wages of sin, okay? The wages of sin, it doesn't matter what your particular preferred brand of sin may be. It may be pride. It may be self-centeredness. It may be greed. It may be lying. It may be substance abuse and addiction. It may be any variety of sexual uh, sins and immorality. It may be self-righteousness that makes you see yourself better than all the other people. Whatever it is, we are all sinners, Every last one of us. And the wages of sin is what? It's death. The scriptures say that all have sinned. There's no exceptions to this. All have sinned and all have fallen short of God's glory. That means that we are all by nature, as Ephesians says, children of wrath. That means we are born under the wrath and the judgment of a holy God. Every one of us, it doesn't matter who you are, what your name is, where you're from, none of that matters. We are all under sin. But Jesus did something incredible. Jesus has done something incredible. The text says he became our sin. Christ 
became our sin. The Father made the Son sin, even though he knew no sin. What this means is that on that cross, when Jesus died, he did not die for his sin. He was tempted in every way and yet without sin. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for your sin, friends. He died for my sin. He bore the penalty and the judgment for our sins on that cross. And he bore them in their totality. He suffered and he entered into the judgment that all of us rightly deserve for our sin and our rebellion. So on that cross, Christ becomes our sin. But notice that Jesus didn't just take away our sin. He didn't just become our sin. The apostle Paul also says that he gave us something. So Jesus on the cross takes our sin. He's crucified. He puts our sin to death. He dies in our place, paying the wages of our sin and rebellion. And he also gives us his perfect righteousness. Christ takes our sin, and in return, he gives us his perfect righteousness. That's the, that's the great exchange. That is to say that by union in Christ, our sins are put to death in his death, and his righteousness becomes ours. We possess the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to us. And what that means, friends, is that when God looks upon us, he does not see our sin. Why? Because Christ became our sin and he was put to death and our sins have been put to death with him being forever nailed on the cross. What God sees is the perfect righteousness of the obedient son. That's yours. It's not added to your righteousness. We have no righteousness to add it to. All of the righteousness of Christ is ours by faith and union in him. So Christ sees not our sin. It's crucified. It's put to death. What he sees is this perfect righteousness of Christ. This is the exchange. Jesus takes our sin, all of it, completely. He puts it to death, and we receive his perfect righteousness, lacking nothing. So what did Jesus do? What did he do? He died for our sins. He died for our sins and he took them from us, something we desperately need. And he obeyed the law of God perfectly, something none of us could ever do. That's what he did. He obeyed and then he suffered and he died. Now, what difference does that make? What difference does it make for us? How has that changed us? How has it changed the world? Look at verses 16 through 17. It says, from now on, meaning we've changed our mind. We understand something we didn't understand before. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. I mean, we see Christ for who he is. We understand what he has done. Verse 17, therefore... If anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Anyone who is in Christ, anyone who has come to understand and see Jesus for who he is, it does not matter how much of a mess you've made of your life. If you are in Christ, the apostle Paul says, you're new. You are a new creation. Understand Jesus does not make us a slightly better upgraded version of ourselves. Jesus does not help us save ourselves. Jesus does not invite us on a journey, a spiritual journey of self, uh, self-discovery or deconstruction for that matter. Jesus makes us something new. That's what he's interested in. He makes us something new. It is so radical and it is so new. The apostle Paul says, new creation. Not you're becoming a new creation. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has been removed. 
being crucified with Christ on the cross. The new is here. The old is gone. The new is here. That is the resurrection life of Christ running and living in us. That is to say that when we finally see Jesus for who he is, when we confess that he's not just a mere man, that he's not just a great teacher, that he's not just a moral example. When we understand he is the son of the living God, he is Christ, our Lord and our Savior, something profound and radical happens. It is even more radical than your first physical birth. It is amazing. In Romans 10.10, the apostle Paul says, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is what? saved. We are saved. That is to say, when we believe in and we confess that Christ is Lord, friends, we are saved and we are freed. We are made a brand new creation. We are free from the bondage and slavery to sin. We are free from the wages and the penalty of sin. We are free from the reigning power of sin. We are free from the wrath and the judgment of God. We are now free to enjoy God as our Father. We are free to confess and be honest about our sin. We are free from shame. We are free from guilt. We are free from condemnation. We are free from our past. We are free from the need to have others think highly of us. We are free from the fear of death. And in Christ, we are free to live. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. There is no greater freedom that we can possess than to be free in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so baptism is a symbol, and it's a sign, and it's a celebration of that incredible reality. We have been united with the death of Christ. His death is our death. To demonstrate this, you're going to see people placed into the water, down into the water, just as Christ was placed into that tomb, so they will be placed down and into the water. We're also united with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as Christ rose from the grave, so they will be raised from the water. They will come out. Amen? Amen. Just as Jesus lives, now we walk in newness of life. And as each person enters into the water, we are to hear God speaking. We're to hear God speaking the same words over them that he spoke over his son at his baptism. Some of you remember when Jesus was baptized, something profound happened. The heavens opened up, the spirit descended in the form of a dove, and the father spoke. And the father said what? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Friends, to be united with Christ in baptism is to have the father speak those same words over us. He is saying, this is my son. This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. You go, aren't we still sinners? Aren't we still gonna make mistakes? How is it that the father could be well pleased with us? Friends, it's because of this. Our sins have been put to death in Christ and we possess the righteousness of Christ. And so the father speaks his love and his affection over us. You belong to me. You belong to me. If you've not yet been baptized, I want to invite you to be baptized. Not this morning, not now, but we can do this again. You know that, right? We can do this again. And so if you've not been baptized at the end of our service, come and talk to a pastor. We will be at the front. We would love to talk with you. But many of you have already been baptized And so as you witness these baptisms and as we celebrate those together, I want you to be reminded of God's faithfulness to you. When you came to faith in Christ and you entered into those waters, God spoke a promise of his love over you. He has been faithful to that word. He has been faithful to that promise. He loves you still and forevermore. Let me pray, and then we will get on with our celebration here. 
Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the incredible thing that you have done. You were crucified for us. You have risen for us. And through faith and union with you, our sins have died. They have been put to death, being nailed on that cross. Your righteousness is now ours. And new life, your new resurrection life is running through our veins by your spirit as he dwells in us. And so, Jesus, we thank you for making us new creations. And we ask for your continued protection and provision for those who will enter the baptismal waters this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are going to do some...